Got it. Okay, great. Okay, so we're recording? Yes. Wonderful. And we're ready. Let's get started. Okay, great. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Carol Hernandez and I'm a senior instructional designer at CELT. And uh, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, uh, we just wanted to quickly introduce ourselves. I'm Carol and um, my um, co-facilitator is Catherine. That's me, I'm Catherine Scott. I'm the Assistant Director for Faculty Development, Assessment, Testing and Evaluation Services. And we just wanted to give a special thank you to Rose Tirada Esposito and Patricia Aceves, who are both um, our CELT leadership. So um, when we start these uh, discussions, we always talk about CELT and why we're doing this. You know, why is CELT having these discussions? So um, CELT is the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching, and we uh, collaborate with faculty. So um, the purpose of this conversation is to create a space for faculty to talk across disciplines about what excellent teaching looks like for them. And um, one of our missions is to um, talk about inclusive teaching, which we consider excellent teaching. Mm -hmm. And so what are we going to address today? We're going to talk about, you know, what is organization, organizational change and, you know, what does that look like? Um, some self-reflecting on our teaching and in our specific disciplines, um, interrogating our teaching assumptions, challenging the status quo, and hopefully we'll provide some tips and strategies so that you all can um, take action. And now I want to turn it over to our panelists so that they can introduce themselves before we get into um, the question. So Robbie, uh, if you can introduce yourself, that'd be great. Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Robbie Kincaid. I'm a clinical assistant professor in the School of Health Technology and Management. I'm also the director of the Center's uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Good afternoon, I'm Lisa Johnson. I'm the chair of the Department of Respiratory Care and the Program Director, and I'm a Clinical Associate Professor. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Pierre Glaude. Um, I'm a Clinical Assistant Professor in the Department of Physical Therapy. All right. So here, um, I just wanted to give, give people a little bit of information um, to sort of frame the discussion that we're gonna have today. So the School of Health Technology and Management, um, they created an office of the Director for Diversity and um, they established that in June of 2020. The mission of the office is to work collaboratively with faculty, staff, students, and other stakeholders in order to promote a broadened individual and collective understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So this office, was established as a result of the vision of a small group of faculty members who recognized the need for a dedicated effort to address DEI related issues within the school. To that end, six working groups have been established to carry out the effort. They are curriculum, mentorship, professional development, research and grants, disability awareness and action, admissions, retention, and recruitment. Um, so we're going to go to the next slide where I just wanted to, again, give a little bit of framework for organizational change. So um, on that slide, we discuss one model. So there's many models for organizational change and the panelists will tell us about what models inform their work. Um, but so one model uh, comes from a book from Cotter and Cohen, which is called The Heart of Change and they identify eight steps. So um, some of these steps are mirrored in the stories that we're gonna hear today. Um, and I just wanted to give folks who maybe don't have a background in um, organizational change, like just to give them, introduce them to some of these concepts, some of these steps. So then um, as we go forward and discuss this, that they might have some, um, just like a little framework to go, to go on. So um, we can start now with questions. Um, so we're gonna just throw out the questions to the panelists and they can answer it 
um, really in any order they like. And really it's about their story, their experience. And you know, we're just lucky that they wanna share it with us. So we're really happy to hear um, you know, what they're doing and how they're doing it. So the first question is um, to the panelists, looking back, please tell us the story of how and when this project got started and what role you each played in that. And then also if you could tell us about external and internal forces that were happening at that time. Thank you, Carol. I'm, I'm gonna start um, with answering the, the question and I'm gonna share our story and our story started almost about five years ago um, with the black and brown faculty that are in the School of Health Technology and Management. And we knew each other individually, but we did not know each other collectively. So we, we, came, to, we came together and I, I honestly would say some of us coming together was due to the late Carlos, um, to late Carlos Vidal. And he sort of encouraged us to, to come together. So when we came together, we came together as, as support when it came to teaching, when it came to um, encouraging each other to go back for a higher degree. Um, we also would talk about different social justices, whether it was equity in the classroom, equity on the outside, if there were social justice things that were going on in society within our school, within, within Stony Brook. So we would come together and we would talk and we would share. So we were together for, I would say a good five years, about five years ago, we, we came together and, and we, we, we talked. So there was no really external internal forces in the beginning five years ago that brought us together. I would say really maybe an internal force was Carlos who said, hey, maybe you guys can be a support um, to each other. So that's how we, we came together uh, originally. So I'm gonna pass it over to, to James in terms of what, what was the next steps that that happened from there. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'll add a little bit to Lisa's story or our story here. I think um, our, uh, this group coming together was very organic. Um, as I shared with uh, Carol and Catherine previously, um, I had to look this up myself, but you, when you enter a room or when you enter an organization, um, you, or at least I do, I tend to um, do a safety check to see, um, you know, who do I identify with? Who do I, um, who, who am I drawn to? Who am I not? drawn to and that can be there may be a, a, a variety of reasons why you are drawn to someone or a group of people and why you're not um, but entering into academia um, I quickly noticed actually before I entered uh, even as a student I qu quickly noticed that um, there were not a lot of um, black and brown uh, faculty and staff in academia and I had to look it up myself I believe this stat is um, about 75% um, uh, about 75% of faculty members and staff members in academia are, are, are white, um, male and female. So I think um, we, we looked to each other for advice. Um, we had multiple um, levels of ex expertise or um, you know, being at Stony Brook, Lisa being the longest, she she kind of rallied us together. Um, and so uh, last year, uh, after the events of Ahmaud Aubrey and George Floyd, um, we started talking amongst ourselves just to be a support group for each other. I know personally, I um, um, was a little bit um, disturbed or frustrated that that um, we, I, I was in meetings where the conversation strayed towards um, recipes and, and um, some, you know, and, and how was your weekend? And I think that that lit a fire in, in me and I shared that with the group that I thought that this was the time um, to bring to our leader um, some of our, some of the things that we valued, um, some of the things that we thought would make the school better, enhance the school. And we thought that there were, um, the school needed a, 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 an, ex an expanded lens um, to look at um, 
you know, the way the school was structured, the way decisions were made, um, and so on and so forth. And we were lucky enough um, that we had leadership that was willing to listen to us. Um, so we, we drafted a letter and we sent that to her and she met with us immediately and, um, and, and brought in uh, to that idea. So I'll pass it on to Robbie and she can uh, continue the story. Okay, so again, we were very lucky uh, in the sense that in the very beginning, five years ago, we did have support from leadership um, and as, a, as an uh, organic group of people just coming together for support and then followed that up um, after the late Carlos Vidal when uh, Stacey Jaffe Gropak came to our school and uh, was very receptive to our, 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 our intentions. And I think it's important to reiterate that simply because without leadership and support, it's gonna be very difficult to get any kind of um, organic or any kind of even, even structural change uh, within institutions. We need the support of our leadership. So we were very lucky to have that. Um, and so, and looking at the next question, what informed our planning process in terms of the six working groups, how did we settle on those and what's the mission of each? Um, we have uh, you know, an admissions retention and recruitment um, session as um, section as, uh, as was mentioned previously, along with curriculum, disability awareness and action, mentorship, professional development and training and diversity grants and research. And we chose those six because we saw that as we looked at our school, where could we make the best or get the best bang for our buck in terms of maximizing what we were trying to do. Um, as James um, listed um, or, or spoke about, um, there were very few black and brown faculty and staff in our school. Um, and our school is a microcosm of the United States. What's happening in our school is no different than what's happening on college campuses throughout. And so, um, our student population, though, is different in the sense that we do have, in some programs, um, a nice reflection or a microcosm of the United States. And so we want to look at admissions, retention, and recruitment to ensure that our students coming in, as well as our faculty and staff coming in, can look like uh, the students that are coming in. And we want to um, try to engage um, all of our faculty and staff in, help, in helping to make that happen. And then of course, um, as academics, we have to look at curriculum um, and look and see where there are sections of our curriculum that might perpetuate um, structural inequity or systemic inequity um, as opposed to um, you know, um, providing pedagogy that's inclusive and celebratory of differences. Um, and then when you think of diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, uh, we like to think of diversity as just meaning different, just in terms of different. So to that end, we see that we're all different in some ways and very similar in other ways. So why did we pull out disability awareness and action as opposed to having an LGBTQ or a strictly black and brown folk who are strictly women-based? We chose disability awareness and action because when we think in terms of inclusion, um, oftentimes we look uh, uh, at people and we look at people's race, ethnicity, or their gender identity, uh, or their visual um, sexual sex, and as opposed to uh, thinking about uh, differences that might occur amongst people who are who are different from uh, from us in terms of their uh, disability, and we need to be aware of that. So to that end, we have our disability awareness and action uh, committee. Um, and then mentorship we think is very, very important, not for just for students, but for faculty and faculty and staff and staff. Uh, mentorship, not only for those coming in, but for those who are already here, because it's important to mentor uh, one another in ways that help us to uh, excel in our careers, as well as to be comfortable in our own spaces within the school. And then we have professional development and training um, as kind of like the core of, of what we're doing um, in a sense that uh, people don't know what they don't know. 
So, and they do know what they do know. And our intentions with uh, professional development is not to change minds and hearts, but to inform minds and hearts because change happens internally and it happens on a continuum. And uh, we subscribe to the notion that when we speak about diversity and difference from a professional development lens, that we realize that people don't become culturally competent. That's something that we reject. We are more in line with thinking about cultural humility and that being a longer process, a lifelong process of, of constantly looking and reflecting and seeing uh, where we might have bias or where we might have um, some commit um, microaggressions or uh, you know, um, implicit bias. Uh, and then the diversity research and grants committee is important because we like to think about how our work uh, informs, can inform other uh, programs and uh, how we can get grants to further our causes. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of what we're doing, um, I guess, with the next slide. So um, we can move forward that. So, um, I, you know, I, we don't, we only have one more slide of questions. So we, we kind of need to maybe go back a little bit and maybe do, do the other panelists want to talk a little bit more about the origins or, you know, how you brought this to your dean, how you organized, because I think a lot of people might be still at those beginning stages. Mm -hmm. I can I can I can share that you know again our development was organic and it came out of a need for um, for support and we looked around and like James says you know we did the safety check and we looked around to see where we could find the support so we came together as a group well before any national recognition of systemic racism and and social injustice. So um, I think that looking back on how we became and looking forward as to how other groups might want to start their diversity initiatives, I think if, if we look at, um, I think you had a slide that spoke to um, creating urgency and forming powerful coalitions. Um, the urgency was there for us. I think this is um, Cotters and Cohen, uh, organizational change, um, you know, the need was there in terms of urgency. Um, and uh, we formed our coalition um, that came well before, um, you know, any of the national spotlight on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I think it's important to, to recognize that we didn't come together as a means of having this office for diversity, equity, and inclusion to begin with. We started as a group of people that needed support. Um, for, for one another. And we found that support in one another through the leadership of the late Carlos Vidal. Um, and I think, you know, uh, again, I can only share that, um, you know, our, our team was developed based on a group of people that just came together organically. And we had a vision. And that vision was to change the way we uh, look at diversity, equity, and inclusion in our school. And um, I, can't, I can't reiterate enough the importance of having leadership that's supportive. So the question becomes, how do you get leadership that's supportive if you're already in a situation where your leadership is not supportive? Um, and I think that's where uh, pow there's power in numbers. And I think there's power in creating that sense of urgency. I mean, people often won't react or act, if you will, if unless there's a fire lit. And so certainly the events happening with George Floyd and uh, Ahmaud Arbery and some others might've been the uh, catalyst for change for a lot of other institutions. That was not what was the catalyst for change for us. That was just another day in the life of black and brown folk to be quite frank. Um, but we did communicate our vision to our Dean who was extremely receptive to it um, we had, we still have barriers to action. Um, the reality is, is that there are people within our school who share different views about the importance of DEI and even what DEI means and its value. Um, but we, we strive not necessarily to remove the barriers um, to action, but to get 
those folks who um, might not agree or might have a different perspective on how to work around diversity, equity, and inclusion to see things the way that we do. Uh, we have tremendous so, short term, I'm sorry. So Robbie, I was gonna say that just to go back to, to the question, like, and I think you, you did a great job in answering in terms of how, how does someone start? Mm -hmm. If someone was going to start, where mm -hmm. do you start from? And, and for us, we were unique in our starting process, but I think the key was we, we took a chance. Yeah. We, we took a chance and James was instrumental in putting the, the email together to send to Stacy. And, mm -hmm. and Stacy responded. So I think the first step for anyone in starting the journey is to have individuals who are willing to stand with you mm -hmm. to move forward, to mm -hmm. establish something and whatever that something is. So, and that, that was, we were already together. So we did not have to come together, but we took that next step. And James can speak about the letter that, that he, that he, the email that he put together so mm -hmm. that way we can send it to Stacy, and we did not know how Stacy was going to respond. We we had no idea, so we were fortunate, as Robbie already mentioned, to have someone that was willing to listen to us, mm -hmm. and then also willing to work with us about changes that we could do with an SHM. So I don't know if James want to add anything more to how we started in that respect. Yeah, I, I sure can. Um, before I do, um, I think we would be remiss to not mention. The rest of our group members. Right. Um, we had Gannett Weldislavsi from the Occupational Therapy Program. We had Rashid Davis from the Physician Assistance Program. We had Carmen Hall from uh, Applied Healthcare Informatics. And am I missing someone? Nope, that's it, right? That's yeah. the six of us. That's the six um, six. And so just to go back a little bit, the creating sense of urgency, um, I think for our group, I think we're putting it nice. Um, that uh, yes, we came together organically, um, but I, I think, at least for me, it was a sense of survival. And some mm -hmm. people may think this, that's an extreme to use that term, but it, it's, it's a sense of professional survival when you look around, not because of any uh, uh, fault of any one leader or any fault of, of uh, one program director, um, it's the fault of a system where you look around and you see that you don't get the same opportunities. You are a one-off. You are uh, a token. So when you notice that, um, you have to find ways to survive. And sometimes it's something as simple as what's going on in the news. Um, things that are affecting your communities, your colleagues may not, um, it may not be a priority for them they may not have that sense of empathy to understand what um, you and your family may be going through. So if that is the work environment, how can you foster uh, an inclusive and excellent classroom environment? It's impossible. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we did that to, uh, I don't think it was something that, um, I don't think it's something that we formalized or it's something that we sat down and wrote, but it was just natural that these are the things you do to, to, um, to survive. So when um, it, ha when uh, I call it when the world burned, burned, burned down um, last, last year between COVID and social justice initiatives, um, uh, I felt like it was easy um, for us to say, this is it. Mm -hmm. You spend a lot of waking hours at work. And so this needs to be a comfortable an acceptable environment for everyone. So um, I think for uh, a lot of, um, for myself and my colleagues, it was time to have a call to action. Um, I remember telling the group, our group, that I was tired of hearing the word diversity. I said, throw it in the garbage. It's cool to put it on a logo. It's cool to put it on a website. It's cool to put it in a, in a name. But diversity without action is mute. There's no, there's no, who cares? Mm -hmm. um, and I think what was instrumental is that uh, individuals in our group were also alum of the school. So mm -hmm. I had been an alum twice before. Mm -hmm. I've been a faculty member in another program. We had um, Robbie has been here for many years. Lisa has been here for many years. Carmen is an alum, or she's an alum. 
Gannett is an alum. So we spoke about our experiences as students, as faculty members. And I think that was very impactful. I, I, I'm sharing our story. I don't know if there are other schools or, or programs that have um, people who are that, that have close ties with the, their institution. But I think that was a powerful um, strategy for us to get to our leader and say, hey, this is what happened to us as faculty members. This is what happened to us as students. If our job is to create an excellent atmosphere for education and an excellent atmosphere for professional development, these are our stories and this is what needs to change. So I think it was easy for us to take that risk. Very well said, uh, James. I, you know, I think you know you 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 brought the realities home, and I think um, you know uh, the the point that you made about living in your own skin and having to come to work day to day and and deal with the isms that exist, to, you know, as it as it were, uh, made it very very uh, necessary for us to come together more formally, um, as opposed to being a, a, a supportive group. So. Um, what's happening with our project. So, you know, we have our different working groups and um, what we're starting to see now is some movement. Um, these things don't happen overnight. Um, we're still in our first year of development. And I think that we're, we're coming along nicely in terms of what's happening with our, with our programs. Um, we've done, uh, you know, several um, events, school-wide events, uh, campus-wide events, um, at, that were successful. And um, I just like to take a minute and share what some of those things have been um, because I think they speak to the kinds of work that we're trying to do. Um, we had, we're, we, we're just coming away from February, which was Black History Month. But, but even prior to that, I think over the summer, as we started to develop and determine what our working groups would be, um, we started thinking about um, the calendar, a diversity calendar, and what are some of the things that we're going to do to let our, our, our colleagues know that we're here, that we're here to stay, and that we're not um, moving, um, you know, we're not moving anywhere, we're here to, we're here to stay. And so um, we did a, an event um, where we introduced ourselves, uh, it was kind of like our coming out, borrow the pun, party, and um, we were received. And um, as we continue to do projects within our school, I think it, for some folks in our school, it's kind of legitimizing our existence, not to suggest that we're not legitimate, it's just to suggest that, you know, in, in our day to day, um, there are people who might not have the same sense of, of urgency as we do in terms of making some of these things happen. So when Black History Month came, um, we had an excellent presentation where we utilize people from our school because this is when you start talking about support. We're, we're not a funded program. It's not like we have uh, money to implement programs. So one of the things that we use and that's at the soul of our um, existence is a quote from the late Dr. Vidal. And that is that relationships are primary and everything else is derivative. So we've used the relationships that we've developed with the campus community to get some of our projects off the ground. So we were lucky enough to have uh, Dr. Jadan Phillips uh, come and do a workshop to talk about uh, the resistance of some folks who are black and brown to, uh, to uh, getting the COVID vaccine. So that's just one example of what we did in Black History Month, as well as you know, um, the usual hosting, you know, the, the faces and, and uh, the, the stories of uh, black leaders that often are overlooked um, in, in society. Um, uh, now, you know, the next question I'm looking at is uh, how do we uh, handle colleagues who think they're supporting our work and being an ally, but really aren't? Um, we're currently working interprofessionally uh, within programs in our school as well as outside our school. And uh, we're doing a project where uh, we're going to bring together um, faculty and students for research day. And I can share with you that um, there are people who are on board sometimes because as James put it, it's the flavor of the month. Diversity is the flavor of the month. But um, you know, we work with, with folks um, to get the job done regardless of what their intentions are. 
because it's important to do that. So we're currently working interprofessionally with, in our school with programs um, to develop a uh, research day that would it consist of students and faculty and staff coming together to talk about diversity research and diversity grant making. Um, I don't know if Gannett Wellness Lessy is on the call, but she's been very, very uh, instrumental in working with us to get us grants and, and to write grants. And uh, one of the things that we're doing um, in order to find out who, how the support looks in our school is a survey, a climate survey. Um, and we're in the process of developing that, uh, which I think is very important at the beginning of any div diversity program is that you, uh, you know, get a look at your atmosphere that you're working in. So we're currently uh, administering a survey uh, to all faculty and staff. Um, and I think Lisa, you might want to jump in and talk a little bit more about that. Um, thank you, Robbie. Uh, the, the climate survey right now, we it is done, but we have shared it with our Dean with Stacy to get any feedback. Um, and so hopefully within the next you know, a couple of weeks, we'll be able to send it out. And once again, as Robbie mentioned, this could be something that can help drive us mm -hmm. and the direction that we, we need to go within the school and to um, also help us with some of the different working groups. And I know that I, in Robbie, if it's okay, I know there was a question that came up about um, a change to recruit students or market programs. So I, if it's okay, Robbie, I just want mm -hmm. to just address that question because mm -hmm. I'm the person who oversees the um, working group for admissions recruitment and retention of students and faculty. Mm -hmm. And we're still in the beginning stages of my of our working group. And some of the things that that we have looked at and just kind of start to talk about is how do we how do we market students? How do we market programs? How do we recruit students? So we're just in the beginning stage. So it's not really I don't have a, a good answer from the working group perspective. Some of the things that people have shared of different things that they do with their own program. And with their own program, for example, at Stony Brook, there's different organizations on Stony Brook and some of the programs may go to the organizations on Stony Brook to try to recruit students for, for their program. Sometimes they may go out to high schools and be part of career day to try to re recruit students for their program. So to answer that question with the working group, it's something that we're still looking at. We're looking at our objectives what our objective is going to be, what will be our tactics, how we're going to accomplish it. Um, there may be a discussion, we haven't talked about it, but there may be a discussion about doing a survey for admissions, recruitment, and retention for our working group, just to see what goes on in our school, what are programs actually doing in our school for recruitment of students um, into the different programs and how they market their, their programs. So I just wanted to, to answer that question, Robbie, before. But with the climate survey, we still would just wait and go ahead, James. Um, I'm going to go back to um, just answering that question too. I'm going to go back to my original statement and how um, I, we're, we're, or I am, I, I'll keep it, I'll be accountable for the statement, but I, I was tired of seeing diversity uh, um, written everywhere or said everywhere without action. And so what, what does that mean? So many, many of us on this call uh, are from Stony Brook University. And if you're not familiar with Stony Brook University, I think um, um, let me give you some context. Um, Stony Brook is in Suffolk County, Long Island. Um, Long Island is one of the most segregated places in the North. So I can say that um, with confidence as a student and as a faculty member, um, I have witnessed firsthand um, the, uh, the segregation of education, the segregation of resources, the segregation of housing, and so the approach that I took to the team was, this is a public health issue. And we are, we are healthcare providers and we are healthcare educators. So um, I was tired of, of working and listening to individuals whose slide that talked about the comorbidities who was the, the most at risk for cancer and diabetes, um, always being black, brown and poor people. And I um, posed the question to everyone, what are you willing to do about this? Um, is, is it okay? Are you fine having the same slides for the last 30 years? Or do you want to be part of that change? Or do you want to tell the whole story? So these are the, the frustrations that I had um, individually that I brought back to the group. 
So um, to Chris's question, question, do you see things that, that should be changed in the way we recruit students or market programs? Absolutely, because if we stay in the uh, antiquated um, mindset of I don't see color or I don't see class or I don't see socioeconomic status, you're actually doing a disservice because mm -hmm. you are not um, contextualizing your recruitment. You're not thinking of why am I taking this student over that student? And why isn't that student, more of these students coming to my doorstep? Um, I think we look at the, um, I, I, and I understand the metrics of acceptance and passing and passing your boards and jobs in the first six months. But what does that mean if a portion of our population is not getting access to healthcare or a portion of our population doesn't know how to manage themselves? If we are health edu healthcare educators, then we should be healthcare providers for all. So mm -hmm. that was a big push. Um, I know personally, and that's what I brought back to the team. And, and we, we shared that with our leadership as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, thank you, James. Um, you know, and, and looking back, um, like between like the 2016 and 2017, I think we started to come together, you know, around 2016 and 2017, but I've started to do some work on some, some global in terms of Stony Brook uh, global work uh, around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it consisted of like experiential um, uh, working workshops uh, for folks around uh, DEI. And I was impressed with the, and when I say impressed, uh, please take it in the spirit which is intended. I was impressed with the number of people who, who were resistant to change. Um, it, it, it impressed me in the sense that I, I, I had to wake up. Um, I realized that we live in Suffolk County and I realized that Stony Brook is centered right there uh, in the middle of a community that's predominantly white uh, and, and our, our, our students, you know, our black and brown students, you know, have to go, you know, outside of the community in order to get food or in order to get, you know, their, uh, you know, the things that they need. But when I was doing the campus wide work, I was really, it really opened my eyes um, to see that, you know, that there are people on campus that are walking around thinking that this is okay, that there's nothing wrong, that everything's fine. And, and, you know, as, as James put so eloquently, it's not, things are not fine. Um, and so it, one of my frustrations was that in doing that work, um, I was trying to get people to recognize the importance of humility and cultural humility and to recognize that th we have to change the way our system works here at Stony Brook. And the way that program came to an end and the abrupt end of the program to me just spoke volumes. Um, and, 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 and it was a leadership decision uh, to end the, the intervention, uh, but it, it woke me up. I became, you know, I went, came from being, you know, woke to awakened, you know, to like wide awake uh, and, and which is where I am now, um, you know, as a result of having seen some of these things. But I think our, our, our initiative going back to what we're doing um, you know, I, you know, we can't as a group, I don't think we can speak to um, the advancement of DEI appropriately with budget constraints for the campus, but I can speak, I think, to what we do in terms of budget constraints within our school. Um, we are not a, a group that has finance. We don't have the financial backing to do, you know, uh, some things but we rely on, again, the relationships that we've developed uh, interprofessionally, um, externally, off campus with other folks and, and as well as, you know, within our school. Um, and so, um, you know, that, that's where we are with that. Um, I know that there might be people looking for answers um, because there are tight budget constraints, but I think that the work, there's a lot of this work that can be done without, without financial resources human resources, I think, is the most important thing. And if you can rally enough people together, you can get some of this work done. Um, and our existence is evidence of that. Robbie, can I add a little bit more to that? That yes. helps give our, and when I say our, I'm gonna say a collective our. 
mm -hmm. um, um, cause uh, some credence is that I think um, we emphasized to our dean that this needed to come out of the dean's office and mm -hmm. not a, a, a affinity group or a club or mm -hmm. a committee that was um, that was short term. We wanted it to have longevity. We wanted it to last for years and years beyond um, any individual that would that is in this room right now. So um, I think that was a huge um, step in giving our uh, or our group or our organization um, um, credence. Another item that helped is the working groups. Um, we felt like this is a, a monumental task to take uh, and we need the help of everyone, no matter where you're coming from, um, from a, a DEI perspective. If you're willing to do the work, then we wanted you um, on our team. So we, even though uh, we talked about the, the uh, original six individuals that went to the Dean, we uh, enlisted um, other individuals within our school to play a role in these working, working groups, mm -hmm. because the, uh, rega regardless of, of, of um, how many people uh, were, 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 um, brought this to the Dean, we needed everyone to be involved, faculty, staff, students, mm -hmm. um, everyone, you know, it, it, it was monumental. So Jane, yeah. I'm just going to add to that just for a quick, and I think Robbie, um, before he's, I'm sorry, now, in order for change to occur, everyone, not everyone, we, you need the buy-in of it from many people as possible. And, and I th that's the, the key that with the working groups and having faculty and staff involved. And so it's just like James said, it's not just the six of us working. Mm -hmm. um, we have people within the school who want to be involved, who want to see change occur w within the school. Um, so I think that's the, also the, the key to um, the success and not, and like I, not like what was already said that not just have a committee within the school, but coming right. from, the, from, the, from the Dean and saying that, okay, we are committed to long-term change, not a short-term solution, but long-term long change. change. And that, that's the key. In order to get long-term changes, you have to have the people that you are working with. You have to have the faculty, you have to have the staff, you have to have the students. Because if you don't have all involvement, then it makes it's hard for change to actually occur. And I, I would just add that, you know, from a theoretical perspective, if we think in terms of like um, the diffusion of innovation, we started at the very beginning with innovators that are people that are uh, not like the rest of the group, but are very, very interested in this type of work. And it started with us, the, the original six. And then as this diffusion of innovation theory suggests, uh, we were the innovators, but there were people who were watching us to see what we were doing. And those folks who were watching us to see what we were doing became part of our working groups. And um, so that expanded our, our breadth, our, our width and our bandwidth. And then we're now in the process of, of going up that uh, bell curve of diffusion of this innovation, uh, where we're starting to see people engaged in some of the activities that we're presenting to our school. And hopefully we'll, we'll be, we're looking to get to the top of that bell curve where other people who might be like what we would consider laggards or people who are less likely to adopt some of these changes that we're trying to incorporate. Um, once they see that this is the norm and this is the way things are in our school, that they too will come along for the ride. And I just wanna take one minute uh, just to, again, I, I can't stress to you enough the importance of having leadership in our school that supports what we're doing. So, I, you know, I, Dean Gropak, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm gonna put you on the spot and, <laughs> and I'm just gonna ask you just to share uh, how is it and why is it that you're, you were supportive of what we, what we were attempting to do? Thanks, Robbie. Um, never, never being put on the spot by, by you, you guys. Um, first, I wanna <laughs> um, thank this group of, of six who brought this to my attention. I, you know, for those of you who don't know, I was relatively new to the school when this happened. I just joined the school in October, 2019 and then COVID hit. And then 
all this hit. And so it's been sort of a little bit of a whirlwind for me, but I was um, actually so pleased when, when I got the email from this group. Um, I've always had had a you know an affinity for these kind of social justice issues and and equity and I was again being new to the school didn't really know the culture of the school where it sat so this was all news to me and informational and some of the things I heard were devastating some were not surprising some were what I expected but I knew that um you know that there was definitely a need for action and um I really felt that it was important to empower this group to move forward. And um, one of the things that was most important for me was that I think James sort of hit on this a little bit was that it was sustainable, that we weren't just going to put a band aid on this. Like I think so much, ha so many people have done. You know, we had a course, you know, a course of, of social disruption. Now it's a little quieter and, and we, I, I didn't want that. So I, my, one of my only, request was that we would have a sustainable plan here. And that as, as um, James said, that this would last for years beyond all of us being here and that it would change the culture of this school, not just for the moment, but, but moving forward. And that's what's so important. And that's what's so important in these working groups that um, Robbie and her team have established and that people have bought into this, people are working towards goals. This is all embedded very deeply in the strategic plan for the school. Um, and so it's, it's an initiative of everybody. And I'm um, so grateful that this group has brought it forward and will continue to work on it. I, I, I do my best to support it budgetarily wise as far as you know, providing whatever course releases and opportunities for people to have some time to work on this. Um, and um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the work that this group does. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And again, thank them for sharing our experience um, with, with everybody. And it really has been my pleasure and privilege to be able to help support this. Well, we know that we could not do it uh, w without you. So, so we thank you. Um, I just wanted to just address, um, you know, cause I know that there might be some questions about assessment and, and that sort of thing. Each one of the six working groups um, have developed goals and objectives uh, that we want to reach and attain. Uh, for example, the professional development and, and training um, has the goal of, of making sure that we provide uh, um, opportunities for professional development for any and every faculty member that requests or doesn't request um, those, those activities. And so as an example of that, um, We've worked with one of our programs, the SLP, the uh, Speech Language Pathology Program. We've gone into their classroom and we've talked with their students about uh, um, uh, a, a, we had a reading of the book, um, The Spirit Catches You When You Fall Down by Ann Fadiman. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but it's an excellent book for working with young students and talking about um, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion as a public health issue. And so we've been able to go into the classroom and speak with students. But in addition to that, we've also worked with, out with the faculty and done some you know, professional development with faculty as well. Um, we're getting ready to launch a, 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 you know, a, huge, a huge initiative where we're using the film, and some of you may be familiar with it, Unnatural Causes, uh, where we're going to do a viewing of the first film uh, with the school and then uh, the subsequent 30-minute um, segments of it throughout the month of uh, April, but uh, every once a month, uh, once a week in April. Um, and you know, we're looking forward to doing that. Um, uh, as far as diversity in grants is concerned, I know that we just put in one of a grant for the a mini grant for, from the uh, university. Uh, we're looking to use that to um, further the research efforts within our school around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we don't have one of our, uh, one of our members, I don't think is on the call because I think she might be teaching, but there's a mentorship program um, that we have that's very, very good. And it piggybacks off of a mentorship program that had previously existed, which I think Lisa might be able to speak to. 
I'm sorry, just had to un unmute myself. Mm -hmm. um, actually, Robbie, I, I can't really speak to it because I'm not familiar with what um, Rashid is doing with her mentoring group. So unfortunately, I can't speak to it. I was thinking in terms of the age cop, age care. Oh, what, I'm sorry. In regards to, modeled okay. after. So, mm -hmm. um, in regards to the age cop and age care program, those are programs for high school students. Mm -hmm. And the program for high school students was when the different programs with an SHTM would offer the opportunity to uh, allow students to see what the different professions were, like PT, OT, PA, respiratory care, clinical laboratory sciences, for example. So it was a way of exposing um, students in high need school districts in Suffolk County to these different types of health professions, because a lot of times it showed students that there were other options beside being, not beside, but there were other options of going into health professions. A lot of students knew about becoming a doctor, becoming a nurse, but they did not know about the other health professions. So it also allowed opportunities for students to stay in contact with us because some of the students did come to Stony Brook or go to other college campuses. So it gave an opportunity to provide mentorship to these students as well. So in regards to HCOP and H care, those programs were beneficial to expose students to health professions, but also be able to follow them into um, in college to see if they wanted additional support and mentorship, which we did provide if they wanted it. Um, so I'm I here, Robbie. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you are, Rasheen. Hi, how are you? Hi. I right, said so just to just chip in a little bit, thinking about the Alf Lisa, uh, the mentorship um, committee or task force. Uh, so we're more targeting the students in the school um, and being a source of support. Uh, for these students, and we're still trying to organize a few activities in the springtime, um, you know, virtually right now for the students uh, to see how they're adjusting their emotional health um, and any and any resources that we could provide for those students. So we're in the process of recruiting them right now. Good deal, good deal. Um, our Disability and Awareness in Action program, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is a robust group. Um, I don't know that we have anybody on the call um, outside of the original six that's a part of that, but I can share with you that I know that, you know, the chair of that of that program is very passionate about um, inclusion of, of, of uh, people living with disability, both those that are visual and those that are not visual. Um, and I think James might, you want to share a little bit about the curriculum and uh, like a diversity statement uh, for curriculum. I know we were talking about that for a while. Yeah, Robbie, I, I could do that. So um, I lead the curriculum working group and some of the members are here today. And two of the things, two of the um, objectives that we had for this year was to one, um, come up with a, or develop a, a diversity statement that can be used in our school in everyone's syllabi um, or provide examples for the school. Um, and the second was, which is still in, in the works, is to um, develop a school-wide course that talked about, that discussed the social and cultural determinants of health. So um, I'll just leave it at, at, at that. I'm sure our Dean is eager and anxious for us to move forward with that quickly. But I will add um, a little caveat that even though this group was officially, I guess, formalized in um, last summer, it is a lot of work. And um, you have to have people who are passionate about it and are willing to take even their personal time to get this off the ground. And I think the same can be said for any um, one who is part of an, an initial or inaugural group. So even though the deliverable, the, there may not be um, frequent deliverables from the group, it's because of planning. We want this to be um, on a solid um, um, framework, solid structure, so that God forbid, if any of us are not able to do this, it can be easily carried on by someone else or another group. So th this is our first year. We haven't reached our one year anniversary yet. So um, a lot of, you know, the planning phases uh, take a lot of our time. And not um, to, I'm sorry, sorry. Carol. Go, Go ahead. ahead. 
Um, well, I just wanted to uh, just say we have five minutes left. So um, there is one question that was in the chat that we didn't address. So um, maybe we, we could get to that before we wrap up, but go ahead, Robbie, sorry. No, I was just gonna share that, um, you know, insofar as, as the work that we put in to this, again, it's a, it's a, it's a labor of, of love. It's something that we're all passionate about, passionate about but, um, it, and we're, we're willing to put in the time. I just wanted to reiterate what James was saying that we're willing to go the extra mile because we are passionate about the work. Okay, um, so thank you, Robbie. I just wanted to um, read a question that we had in the chat um, from Allison, who is a librarian and um, her, her department is starting a group and they're thinking about what are some short-term wins as librarians, but in general, like, do you have some tips there about some short-term wins that help people build momentum? So they're, you know, so they, they continue to work on these things? Yeah, I, you know, um, if, if I'm understanding the question correctly, short-term wins, um, if that refers to some of the things that we can high five one another about like what we've done and, and how successful we've been, um, you know, I think, you know, I look back at what we did when we had uh, a collaborative effort between the School of Health Technology and Management and the, and the School of Medicine, where we came together to have that, um, you know, discussion and wonderful presentation about um, COVID vaccine and people of color and the hesitancy of people of color, some people of color to get the vaccine. Um, I thought that was a win and, I, you know, it serves to motivate us. But uh, we're also in the middle of Women's uh, History Month, and we're getting ready to pull off another win. Um, but those sh those little wins are the things that sustain us. But we hope that uh, that we our goal is not to become like the go to for different projects and programs. Um, while we appreciate those high five moments and those wins, we know that those are stepping stones to get to the place where it becomes the, the norm that you know that we have diversity equity and inclusion included in all of our pedagogy and all of the things that we do uh, uh, in our in our work in the school and i had 30 seconds to 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 robbie's response there um i would say uh, a short uh short was it a short term, short -term win, win. Mm -hmm. a short term win i would say robbie was way before that for me mm -hmm. and it was um, uh, organizational or, or cultural shift right. or cultural change. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that is I was happy to hear from, um, from colleagues behind the scene, scenes that said, you know, I always wanted to know about this, but I, I, I was hesitant to act. Right. Thank you for providing a platform where we can have open and honest dialogue where we can have, where we can make mistakes because sometimes the teacher needs to be taught as well. So how can we bring this to the classroom if these perspectives, um, um, values aren't part of our daily lives? So I thought that was a small win and I think we can definitely build on that if we can create that atmosphere collegially right. um, amongst ourselves, it, would, mm -hmm. it, it will be more natural to bring it to the classroom. Yes. Well said. That was a great way to sum up what we're doing. Um, James, thank you so much. Um, you know, the time has really flown and mm -hmm. we're at the end of the hour and I want to respect everybody's time. Um, so um, I just wanted to point out that in the chat box, we do have a couple of links for you with resources and a link to CELT conversations where you can continue talking about these issues. We can continue thinking about other panels for the future. Um, and I wanna thank everyone who took the time to come together today. And thank you to our panelists, you were wonderful. And I feel like we definitely wanna hear more about what you're doing and how things are, are going with your project. Um, so for now, I just wanna say um, thank you. And um, do we have an another slide, Catherine? Just our are going out slide. How about I just, we'll send it in the email. Yeah, because <laughs> okay. I know people have to go. So we'll send okay. it in the email. All of our information is in there. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Fine. All right. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, James. Thank, Thank you, you, Catherine. Me.
Yes, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Have Bye. a great day. Happy Bye. Women's Bye. History Month. Yeah. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye. And we can stop recording. Okay. <laughs>